me Carly hope you are all well witches first of all I need to grovel I'm so sorry once again I'm late with this episode the last three weeks saw me going away for witchy events finishing up our recent book for the hedge witches library and packing up around I think like three million Etsy orders not literally and sending them out for you all which are all great problems to have but everything had a deadline and something had to give it wasn't just the podcast after this I am recording content so that we should be good for the next three to four weeks with consistent podcast episodes That gives me a chance to continue thereafter with further episodes. I have to say the following, I'll only ever put a podcast episode out if I feel it's something that will have quality information in it that us witches can use. I won't ever just put out a wafty podcast for the sake of putting one out each week. I know that's probably not a very consistent thing to say, but if I don't feel it's worthwhile, I would rather put out something that is, you know, akin to a workshop that can be used rather than a filler, if that makes sense. Our book review today is for The Bear and the Nightingale, written by Catherine Arden. I have to say, this has to be one of my favourite fiction books ever if not my favourite. This book, I felt as though for the period of reading it, which was albeit brief as I was absolutely hooked, was like temporarily living in Russia in the depths of the forest, in the depths of winter. If you love Slavic folklore and traditions, this book is for you. If you don't, this book is for you. I could recommend this to anyone, I think. There are many references to house spirits in the book. Alongside this book, I'm reading another book on Slavic witchcraft that references the Rosalski, the Domovic and other spirits that are believed in in this region. This book gave me so much further insight into a lot of the beliefs, traditions and offerings that they make to them. This is a pure fairy tale for adults. The writing is poetical, it is absolutely divine. The main character, Vazia, I loved her so much. I wanted to embody her spirit, absolutely fell in love with her. I'll read you the book's blurb to give you some insight into the story. Beware the evil in the woods. In a village at the edge of the wilderness of northern Russia, Where the winds blow cold and the snow falls many months of the year, an elderly servant tells stories of sorcery, folklore and the Winter King to the children of the family. Tales of old magic frowned upon by the church. But for the young Wawa Vazia, these are far more than just stories. She alone can see the house spirits that guard her home and sense the growing forces of dark magic in the woods. A large element of this tale is the Christian church attempting to take over from the old ways in the village and the detrimental effects it has on everyone. How Vazia works to keep the spirits around them appeased to ensure that they are safe. But through this, we see her grow and step into her own power, despite everyone else gradually turning against the old ways, many demonising her in the process. She shows the strength to know what needs to happen and goes against the grain of what everyone else starts to succumb to. At times haunting, other times deeply moving, this book had the power to stir many emotions within me. It was the perfect read for winter, which myself and many members of the Literary Witches Coven agreed upon as it was our book for November. 
Once again, I felt that deep sense of sadness once this book was finished. I'm now on a quest to find another that can hold a candle to this one. A tough task. This book is pure magic in every sense. I felt like I'd returned to that childhood bliss of reading fairy tales once more. So before we get into the rest of today's episode, I just want to say I hope you have all had an amazing Yule, Christmas, holiday season, New Year, whatever you got up to. And I want to thank you all for your amazing support during 2022 and wish you a truly magical 2023, my beautiful witchy friends, sending you an abundance of witchy love right now. Join me after the break for my interview with the documentary producer and director, John Worland, to talk all about one of England's most famous witches, Ursula Kemp, the witch who wouldn't stay buried. Welcome back. So I am here with John Worland. John, so good to have you on the show. Thank you. Thanks for asking me. So John has produced and directed a couple of documentaries, one called Witchfinder, one called Ursula Kemp, amongst many other experiences and different jobs that you've done within your life, which I'm sure we're going to get into as part of this topic today. So welcome to the show, John. This is going to be a really interesting episode. I had the opportunity to meet John recently when I attended a talk at Cultures the Castle as part of their Wicked Spirits exhibition and John was on the panel. It was great to meet you then, John. You had, you know, tons of interesting insight and um, I'm very excited to get into this topic. So to get us started and just to go straight into it, can you tell us about Ursula Kemp? And how you came to recording a documentary on her. Yeah, it it could be a long chat. (laughs) um, (laughs) uh, Okay, Uh, so how does an ex-police inspector and theatre manager get involved with making a documentary about an (laughs) alleged witch? Uh, Yeah, good question. Some uh, gaps to fill in, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Basically, it it is actually uh, a relevant point that that I that I was a, a police inspector because um, mm. when I started doing the research, it it, well, it turned out to be very much a, a cold case, a very cold case. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, when you go back to fifteen eighty two, there's not a lot of heat anywhere. <laughs> so, uh, but basically, yes, I retired from the police service. I started up my own video production business making mainly corporates promotional covering live shows because before the police I was working in in theatre management Mm -hmm. and um, basically I was running a workshop for young people uh, uh, in how to make a short video and they wanted to do a ghost story yeah and we went to Colster Castle to help them do some research and they were exploring the story they've got a, a permanent exhibition down in the sales area to do with one uh, particular uh, villain who we all know and I, I, I still mm-hmm. hesitate to, still hesitate to say his name but we've probably got to get it out of the way so it, it, it is Hopkins and they were intrigued because like a lot of people they know the name or they've heard of Witchfinder General but they they don't know any detail and when they were researching that, um, it suddenly hit me that there's never been a historically accurate drama of the, the witch finders exploits made. Mm-hmm. And so um, they made their ghost story and that was great. I went along to a local theatre, the Headgate Theatre, and suggested to them there was a good opportunity for a community project here. And we could make a film, a a proper historically accurate film about Witchfinder using their 
acting resources, my company to, to make the film. And they, they said, yeah, great. So it was a joint production uh, with um, Kerry King from the Headgate Theatre and loads of volunteers. We had over 160 people in this production. They got a lottery grant and we made the mm -hmm. film Witchfinder. And, and of course, you asked me, how did I come to make Ursula Kemp? And mm -hmm. basically, it stemmed from the production of Witchfinder because while I was doing the research on, on Hopkins and Witchfinder to make it more centred on the victims rather than on Hopkins, I came across the story of Ursula Kemp and I thought, blimey, if I'd have found this story first, I'd have made Ursula Kemp rather than Witchfinder. Ah, and it, yeah. Anyway, we made Witchfinder, went down very, very well, uh, showed for a full week at the Headgate Theatre and then we had to put extra performances on and then I started doing the research on Ursula Kemp and well little did I realise it was going to be not not full time but four years from start to finish before I got the full story teased out uh, absolutely incredible story you just couldn't make it up some of the people that I met along the way people who'd been involved in the horrendous uh, events surrounding this poor woman, you know, took a lot of unraveling, but that's where the, the copper came out. And I really enjoyed trying to uncover the truth when there'd been a lot of well-meant um, speculative stuff written. And like so much to do with the, the, the witch trial tragedies, so much of it is based on hearsay, gossip, and to actually get down to material that has got more than a fair chance of being accurate is, is actually quite, I won't say euphoric, but it was a lovely feeling mm -hmm. to think that I'd got as close to the truth as it was possible to do so. So long answer to the first question that, that um, it was making a, a previous film that led me to the Ursula Kemp story. And I say, I loved it. I loved it. And, and, and uh, the, the idea was, I mean, I don't know if you want me to go on and give you the basics of the story now. And, and then, um, yeah. Yeah, OK, Absolutely. right. If you could in regards to Ursula herself, that'd be amazing. Well, yeah, because this is the trouble you see, because I, I've now lived with, uh, with Ursula for so long. <laughs> I assume everybody knows all about her as well. And of course, that isn't the case. So. Ursula Kemp is fairly typical of the people who were victimised mm. in the fairly early days of the Elizabethan uh, Anti-Witchcraft Act. Now, that came in the early 1560s, and Ursula Kemp was tried in 1582, so mm -hmm. about 20 years after the, the, the Elizabethan Act came into force. Uh, Ursula Kemp um, lived in a small village in Essex on the Essex coast, St Osith. And at that time, there would only have been well, no more than 300 people in the village. And like many small communities, no access to doctors unless you were very rich. And then the treatment you got was perhaps a bit debatable anyway. Mm -hmm. So the... From the pamphlet that was produced afterwards, which is where we get most of our information, it's, it's quite obvious that she did make a small living um, by uh, working occasionally on the land, but also by helping people around her and charging small amounts of money um, for her services. And this is all, uh, so typical of, of how, how many of these stories started. And, of course, mm -hmm. she wouldn't have been called a witch. None of them were called witches. They were known as healers or local wise women or just people who who, who had a, a basic knowledge of, of what herbs could ease pain and so forth in those times. Um, to cut a long story short, she was not a very pleasant woman. That, that comes over with lots of witnesses' stories. You know, she, she was quite um, feisty and mm -hmm. had fa fallings out with lots of people, but then... You know, I think we all do from time to time, but we still don't mm -hmm. sort of go to the extremes that these people did back then. Uh, but the main problem Ursula had was with a neighbour called Grace Thurlow. <clears throat> and uh, they had a not a love-hate relationship, but they had an on-off sort of uh, tolerance with each other. And it started off... Uh, 
Ursula was called in to help when Grace's son fell ill. Probably, it sounds like convulsions, infantile convulsions of some sort. And Ursula probably had no great healing powers at all. But if people like to believe that she did, then she was more than happy that, the, you know, that they, they did that and it increased her kudos in society. Mm -hmm. Anyway, she, it's not disputed that she went in, placed her hands on the boy's forehead and went in and out of the door three times. It doesn't say which direction she went in and uh, said, poor child, how thou art loaden and repeated this three times and so, and said to the mother, he, he'll recover. And sure enough, he did, as most childhood convulsions do to recover. Anyway, mm -hmm. that sealed her reputation. And as a result, Ursula fully expected to be called in to help Grace uh, when she was expecting her next child. Mm -hmm. And Ursula was really totally i was going to say pissed off i don't know like to say that but she yeah, was really all oh, right okay. she was she was totally miffed uh <laughs> where, when when grace decided to to invite someone else in to mm. to help with uh, with the with the miff midwifery situation now of course that wasn't unusual because at these times i mean we we, they, we say written down we see a lot of times that they were midwives well i'm sorry but they weren't they were mm -hmm. women altogether who knew that that was one of the most dangerous times of your life and they all came together mm -hmm. to help and do what they could to say they were midwives suggests that they had specialized knowledge and expertise well yeah. they they didn't they did the best they could and if yeah. things went wrong things went badly wrong and there wasn't a lot they could do about it they didn't understand about rhesus negative and rhesus positive blood um, which today wouldn't be a problem at all if you had any complications in in birth as today it's one of the most dangerous things a woman can go through and so mm. all the women rallied around so you had a collective responsibility but anyway Ursula was not invited to help and uh, so there was a big falling out uh, fortunately Grace's baby a baby girl was born successfully and uh, that was fine but uh, despite all this, when Grace Thurlow became lame, uh, not unusual in the winter in a coastal resort mm -hmm. where you've got sort of damp winds, uh, she called on Ursula and said, look, you know, I know we've had some shit between us, but, you know, mm -hmm. those are, I'm not sure those were exact words. Uh, but she said, <laughs> and she said, you know, can you help me out here? Mm -hmm. And Ursula said, well, yes, I can. Uh, I can help cure your lameness. And she used a, 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 a ridiculous uh, thing that she herself had been sold by, by a con woman. And uh, basically she said, yes, I will help you, but I will charge you 12 pence. Quite a mm -hmm. lot of money, quite a lot of money, more than a week's wages for an agricultural worker in those days. And Grace said, you know, that's, that's knocking it a bit, Ursula. Uh, and I uh, said, so, well, you know, that's, that's it. And Grace reluctantly said, yes, okay, 12 pence. So Ursula said her words and prescribed some hog's dung mixed with chervil, made into a ball, thrown under a, a table, stick it three times with a knife and you'll be all right. And surprisingly, that sort of cure for lameness does not appear today on the NHS. <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> But um, Grace did recover from her lameness, mm -hmm. probably rheum rheumatics of some kind. And when things got warmer, so things improved. So Ursula said, OK, you're OK. Now, now let's have the 12 pence. And you can guess what's coming next. Grace mm -hmm. said, I'm sorry, I haven't got it. Mm -hmm. Now, Ursula th threw her into a rage. And as I say, she could get very, very angry. There's lots of evidence that she got really a real strop on. And she said, OK, if you haven't got the money, I'll take it in cheese, because most people made their own cheese in those days. And uh, Grace said, I can't spare any. Times is hard. You know, austerity mm -hmm. fuel bills going up everywhere. Mm -hmm. And so there was a big falling out, big falling out. And then 
unfortunately, uh, when the new baby daughter was three months old, it fell out of its cot uh, on the hearth, broke its neck and died. So Ursa's nowhere near. She hasn't been in the house for, you know, mm-hmm. two, two months or so. Um, but this is when the complaint is made to the local magistrate, Brian Darcy, that Ursula was responsible for the death of the child. <clears throat> uh, and the only reason is because there's been this constant falling out and falling back in between the two of them. Mm. But that was enough to have her arrested. Uh, she was held in a, a small lockup in, in St. Osith. Uh, there is a building still on the site where the lockup was. So some, some of your listeners may be well aware of the cage. Yeah. So that's, that's probably where she was held uh, on that site, not in that building, but on that site. Mm. And she was held in there for a total of five nights. And she was in, interviewed or interrogated on at least three separate occasions by the magistrate, Brian Darcy. And he also interviewed uh, Ursula's son, Thomas, who was only eight. Uh, but that wasn't unusual. Uh, children were often interviewed and you try, they tried to make them give evidence against their own parents. They must have been terrified, yeah. probably, probably would have yeah. agreed to say anything. Anyway, um, the upshot was that Brian Darcy promised Ursula that, that she'd be treated mercifully if she admitted everything. Uh, and, oh, and by the way, tell me all your names of your other mates who are also involved in witchcraft and this wasn't unusual either Uh, magistrates quite often uh, said yeah if if you admit to it you'll be okay and this this is that he's written this himself in his pamphlet he acknowledges he said this now you can imagine today that would result in the whole case being thrown out but then absolutely normal absolutely normal to say yeah you admit it you'll be fine well, she did take him at his word and she admitted that, although she later retracted it, but she did initially admit that she was a witch. She named a few others. They were in turn arrested. They named a few others. And we ended up with 13 people charged with various offences of witchcraft. Not all capital cases, but three were charged with murder by witchcraft. And some of these related to events that had happened five, ten, no, not ten, five, eight years before. Mm-hmm. And yeah. this, is, this, is, this is the pattern. It also appears in the Hopkins trials where you've got long-running disputes between neighbours are just brought up again. In one case, in the Hopkins trial, you've got one going back 20 years. Uh, and so all the outpouring of pent-up uh, sort of grief and resentment all come out. And we have a trial, and it's the first time in English legal history where you've got 13 defendants on trial at the same time. Uh, three were convicted of murder by witchcraft, Ursula Kemp, Elizabeth Bennett and Alice Newman. And they were sentenced to to death by hanging. Uh, Alice uh, Alice Newman, her sentence was actually reprieved to life imprisonment. And I only found that out two weeks ago. I thought I found out everything I could. And because I I, I realised when I I found the, I I actually found the original trial documents. I went to uh, the National Archives at Kew. uh, And I, I, it was, Oh, I'm digressing. I, I don't. You don't. No, you I carry do on, I, John. It's fine. I, I, we love I, this. <laughs> I, I, I just, I dive about all over the place. But basically, I thought, right, I've got to find original evidence that this is the copying. Mm-hmm. I've got to find original evidence if I can. The best evidence is what was written at the time. So I go to Q. You, you can't just walk in and say I want this. You have to pre-order it. And and so mm-hmm. this huge volume was brought out for me which is all the trials from 1582. And at that time, everything was written on strips of parchment. Mm -hmm. So I'm turning the pages. I'm thinking, I'm in in serious trouble here because it's all in Latin. (laughs) (laughs) And... (laughs) Excuse me. Um, So I thought, ah, names. 
So fortunately, I was able to pick out a few names, but I went from cover to cover and couldn't find Ursula Kemp, Elizabeth Bennett, or Alice Newman. So I went back from backwards to front, and finally I found one document which I, I just spotted Ursula Kemp. Oh, thank goodness. And that was a wonderful, it sounds awful when it's a, such a horrific case, but it, it was a wonderful moment. I actually had yeah. found something that was actually in existence at the time this happened. And I actually held those parchment strips in my hand. And I've, once I'd found that, I found all the documents relating to that case. And I, I whilst I, I, I can more or less work, work out the words, I don't know what they mean. And mm -hmm. certainly I could, I could repeat some of them. And I did say a few of them out loud. And I thought to myself, I wonder if I'm the first person who's spoken these words since Ursula Kemp heard them, you know, wow. and that was, that was a spooky thing. But anyway, I took, I was able to take photographs of them. I've got photographs of the whole lot and it, it shows on the list of convictions for that day. And there's quite a lot, um, mm. not just these 13, but the, on that day uh, at the equivalent of the crown court, which only met twice a year in those days, uh, there were, oh, 80, 90 names, all, all being prosecuted for various offences. Not all, for, you know, murders and things like that, but sort of um, larceny, you know, theft of, uh, if you stole something worth more than um, <clears throat> 20 pence in today's money, you could be hanged. So uh, there were, there were, quite a few hangings uh, and it, it makes you realize with only the one court sitting these people were the trials probably only lasted about half an hour each mm. uh, and that's that's a uh, and they weren't entitled to any legal representation you had no solicitor or barrister representing you when you were on on a charge for your life but anyway i found the the the, the, the trial documents which is wonderful so uh, that's how I knew that uh, Alice Newman was sentenced to death, but uh, I couldn't understand why uh, it didn't appear in the court records that she had been and, and found out, as I say, in a, in a very obscure document that turned up two weeks ago that she, she was reprieved and she, she actually got a pardon six years later. She was in Newgate Prison and she actually was pardoned in 1588. Uh, and I don't know why. I probably never will know what, why. But there yeah. we go. So, so good for her. Wow, um, that's fascinating. <laughs> <laughs> I um, imagine how that must have felt because, in a way, I feel like you've almost been kind of, I don't know, like, have you been haunted by Ursula to bring all of this to the light? And that, that <laughs> moment of holding that book and, and speaking those words. And we all know that words are such, you know, have such power anyway. It must I have do. been such an experience. I cannot it, fathom it, how that felt. It's wonderful. I mean, I, I don't know about haunt, haunted. I wouldn't use that word, but certainly it, it's uh, fate because uh, mm. so many things happened to make things easier for me um, after that. Uh, mm -hmm. So that 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 really was good. Uh, the, 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 of course, the, the story doesn't end there. This is the, the strange thing that you think, well, that would be the end of the matter. You know, trumped up charge. Uh, a nonsense even though Ursula's not there that doesn't matter because the, the the defensive alibi is not available to an alleged witch because you don't have to be there you can send your familiar or imp out to do the, the job yeah, for you yeah. <laughs> so so you know you're stuffed everywhere you go but anyway um we thought that was everybody thought that was the end of it but then we we move forward to 1921 mm -hmm. you think, you know, where's this going and uh, a chap, Mr. Brooker in St. Osith, was digging in his garden uh, for some sand because in St. Osith you don't buy sand, you just dig down and you find it. Yeah. And uh, in his garden, and he found, finds a skeleton. And uh, it's not anywhere near a churchyard, uh, it's not anywhere near a, a, a private burial ground, it's completely outside those areas. And it's also not buried in an east-west orientation, 
because mm. it's, it always am- it amuses me when you go to a cemetery and you go to a non-consecrated part of the cemetery uh, mm. which a lot, a lot of people are now choosing if they want to and you, you're not christian you, you choose to go in the non on consecrated part although i don't see what lot of difference it makes um yeah. that you're still buried in an east-west orientation uh, even though it's not part of your 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 belief system uh maybe mm-hmm. because it maybe because it looks neater i don't know <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but anyway uh uh, this skeleton was found and local newspapers descend on the place and they and i've got copies of those and they report that there's nails driven through the bones it was bound in chains and immediately of course it was declared to be the skeleton of ursula kemp particularly when a couple of weeks later part of a damaged skeleton was found nearby uh, in the same plot in the same garden and that was immediately said oh well that must be elizabeth bennett then uh, no proper examination done but anyway mr brooker was a, a bit of a, a lad and he erected a railing around the grave and charged people sixpence a time <laughs> to uh, to come along and have a peep at the bones <laughs> and he made made quite a bit of money out of this and there are even uh, coach trips from Clacton in the tourist <laughs> season bringing people out to look but you've got to bear I, I, mean, this... I can imagine no I know I know as I say you couldn't, I <laughs> you couldn't make it up you really couldn't but bear in bear in mind I mean this is the, this is the height of entertainment I mean you know we haven't got extenders <laughs> yet so you know this is the next best thing but anyway, there. So this goes on for a few years uh, until the, the house where all this happens uh, burns down. And there's a chimney fire and the house burns down. Mm. Uh, but um, so then things sort of go, go to rest for a while. But in, in 1960s, 1963 to be exact, uh, Mr. Brooker decides he, uh, he'll just expose it. The, the remains one more time uh not the badly damaged one that that was never sort of put on display uh but but uh, but public sensibilities have changed a bit now and it and there's, it's not the same attraction it was so mm. he decides he, he'll sell the site so it can be built on and not surprisingly uh no one wants to buy it with at least one skeleton maybe two uh, still on the on the site so he gets his grandson to try and get rid of the skeleton and uh, the local museum uh, don't want it and uh, we think that there must have been a, a national newspaper story because a character that again a lot of our your listeners will know uh, Cecil Williamson mm-hmm. who ran the witchcraft museum in Boscastle he got to hear about the story and he agreed to buy the skeleton for a hundred pounds and he came down from boss castle to uh, exhume the skeleton and he took it back to the museum and it was on display there for 30 years yeah so so again extraordinary you know, the people who've got involved in this uh, and how they got involved really 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 uh interesting but he um uh, when he approaches his own end in 1999, uh, he sold the museum to Graham King, lovely man. Yeah. Um, oh, incidentally, I, I found some a film of Cecil actually exhuming the skeleton. It was on a local news <gasps> program, so I dug around and yeah. found, found, found that found the um, the archive film of it, and so that's its new new place of repose for quite a while but when Mm. Cecil sold the museum he had already uh disposed of the skeleton that was believed to be Ursula Kemp and it it just disappeared just disappeared Uh, Graham didn't know where it had gone uh no one knows what happened to it and I thought whoa this is strange Mm. and when i was digging around um because by this time i'm I'm involved i interviewed graham and he did a lovely interview which is part of the documentary and uh we 
we couldn't be sure what had happened to the skeleton because it, it he told some people in a letter that Ursula, and he always referred to the skeleton as Ursula, whether it is or not, uh, uh, yeah. is is well bricked up, his exact words, and he's told at least two people that. So that was it became a mystery, and that became really the focus of my digging around to see what had happened to it. And, mm. and the trial went cold for a little while, and <clears throat> someone said, oh, it's been exposed. So there was a, a, an eccentric collector in America has got it. And I thought, oh, blimey, that's the end of that. Bearing in mind, all I wanted to do when I set out was to make a documentary about the story, little knowing I would become so directly involved in trying to find the actual skeleton that was uncovered. Yeah. But um, I carried on digging and I eventually found that it had somehow got into a private collector's possession in Plymouth. Yeah. Uh, uh, Robert Lenkovich, an eccentric artist, very eccentric artist. And it's still a, there's certainly a bit of skullduggery going on as to how he acquired it. But he, he, the mm-hmm. bottom line is he did, he did acquire it. Mm-hmm. I found out, I found out he had acquired it and uh, thought, great, OK. And, and then found he died fairly recently. He died in 2002. Yeah. Uh, uh, and bearing in mind, I'm doing this in 2012, my research. So we're, so we're quite, quite close now to, to but um, I contacted his solicitor and much to my surprise, the solicitor agreed to do me an interview as well. And um, I was allowed to visit and see the skeleton down wow. in, in Plymouth. Uh, uh, this, I had to, swear on all sorts of things that I wouldn't say where it was because they've been approached by a number of unusual mm-hmm. people to yeah. <laughs> um, to try and get hold of it and so I said yes that's fine and uh, so I did go down uh, after you know, all this had ha- finished I, I, I was able to reveal where it was but not at the time and it was in one of uh, Robert Lenkovich's libraries and he had kept the skeleton in a, in a makeshift coffin on his piano in his library. Um, not, for, not for exhibiting, uh, just he wanted to have it there. So a wow. little bit unusual, a little bit unusual. Um, <laughs> the, the, the skeleton itself was tied up in, in, in Robert's estate. He had a very complicated estate. He, he owed more than two million pounds he hadn't paid council tax uh, rent or rates on his properties he, he owned or managed about nine different properties in Plymouth and it took his solicitor or oh, several I think five or six years to uh, to sort out his estate and so nothing could be done with the skeleton yeah. until this was all sorted out and so I said, well, look, I can help you out here because you know, um, you know, I can have the skeleton taken back and reburied, if you like. And and they said, well, well no, you, you, you can't let that happen yet because we don't, we, you know, we, we've got to sort everything out. We can't give anything away from the estate. So I said, well, look, at least let me have it examined. It's never been examined since it was first uncovered in 1921. Wow. And I, thought, and I said, you, you don't know. How old the thing is? I mean, is it mm-hmm. the same one that was uncovered in 1921? I mean, Robert has so many weird and strange things. You know, is it is it a recent murder victim? And of course, yeah. that really that really put the shits up them because they they hadn't thought of that. And so, so so they said okay. So so when I said yeah, I could I could get it examined. They said okay, but it's got to be examined here. You can't take it away. Oh, for goodness sake. Okay. So I got Jackie McKinley from Time Team to to go yeah. down and, and examine it. And thankfully, she was able to show from the photographs that were taken in 1921 and a comparison with what was on the tape in front of her that she was able to say, yes, definitely, this is the same skeleton that was removed uh, from St. Osef in 1921. And she also found several things on the skeleton, which were very helpful and told us a lot about the nature of the person, uh, what sort of a life, uh, quite a hard life. But then to be fair, fair, you know, unless you're in the gentry, 
anybody yeah. who's who, they would showed similar signs so but uh, and then i had um carbon dating done as well uh, because it was necessary to show that you know it, it wasn't a more recent uh, death and fortunately the 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 carbon dating came back and put the remains bang on the sort of mm. late six late 16th century so you couldn't get much better than that in in showing that the, you know, the, it was the, the original skeleton that was uncovered doesn't prove yeah. it was Ursula Kemp but it yeah. does and it does it also revealed some some uh, a bit of iron spike still through one of the bones um uh, but that uh i was able to show again this is the coppering coming out this and, and i got jackie mckinley to to also uh show that this is the case the 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 spike was, was put in after the initial discovery in 1921 the spike was put in shortly after the the skeleton was uncovered and that was put in i'm sure by mr brooker to simply make oh, the, okay. the witch story more believable so well, charming well, man. Char- charming man desecrates yeah. a body simply to get more sixpences <clears throat> Yeah, so, I never found that at all, but no, very no. troubling. Yeah, yeah. So there we go. Anyway, cut. I, I told you I would drip on, didn't I? But, no, uh, you are more uh, than we are loving this. I'm, I mean, you know, I'm loving hearing all of this. So, uh, let's cut a long story short. Uh, well, I'm not cutting it short. Uh, <laughs> we we uh, we're now at the situation where we we're happy that we've got the same skeleton that was uncovered in 1921. It was probably exhumed illegally. I couldn't find any trace of a home office exhumation order. Uh, But then in 1963, when things happened like this, there wasn't the same sort of... And I think the moment you say it's a skeleton of a suspected witch, again, I, I, I can't prove it, but I suspect people weren't as interested as they might be today. Uh, mm. but uh, it seems un- unthinkable to me that you can just remove, casually remove uh, ancient remains and and have them filmed and put on the local news and no one blinks an eye about the legality of it. But anyway, there we are. And when uh, the Lenkovich estate was finally resolved and they'd, they'd got the results of the analysis I'd had done, they eventually... Uh, after a period of about four years, as I say, when when I first came on the scene with this, uh, they agreed to release the skeleton to me. And it was a wonderful day uh, where people who'd been involved along the way at my end were able to meet in St. Osith and the skeleton was reburied back in unconsecrated land, not in Mm. the back garden again, where it wouldn't have any protection. (laughs) but it was in unconsecrated land uh, in St. Osith Cemetery. And it, we took lots of advice, and there's a wonderful organisation called Honouring the Ancient Dead. And mm-hmm. the, it's very sensible advice, and that is, of course, when you are reburying uh, ancient remains, you should never make assumptions about uh, your particular beliefs about what they might have wanted or what, it's probably a reflection of what you want and as far as possible those remains should be buried as they were found and so in that regard um St. Osith Parish Council were actually helpful in this respect they weren't helpful in another respect but they were helpful in one respect and Mm. that is they found a plot in the cemetery where the remains could be buried in a north-south orientation in the way that they were found and it's the only grave in the cemetery in a north-south orientation so that was a lovely, lovely thing. Wow. Uh, so, so we had a great little ceremony. It was the happiest funeral I've ever been to, uh, where wow. those remains. Yeah, and uh, so that became the, the the story. Oh, of course, it wasn't that straightforward. Uh, when the remains were released, I brought them back here to Colchester, where I live, and yeah. 
we, we had the remains here for, for nearly six months because um, I don't know if you've ever tried to, to bury human remains when you don't have any paperwork for it, but people sort of look at you in a strange way. <laughs> <clears throat> and, uh, and I had to, you, you, try, you try getting a burial certificate from the registrar when you haven't got a doctor's certificate to say, I can't even imagine how much that, you know, how interesting that would have been. And, and I, well, that's right. And, and I said, and I said, you know, I've got this old skeleton I'd like to bury. <laughs> you know, haven't got any paperwork for it, but you know, trust me, I'm an ex copper, and that didn't cut any ice either. So, uh, who knew? So, I know. So <laughs> I ended up writing to the coroner. Uh, and the coroner wasn't particularly helpful, and and it took, uh, in the end, a threat to the Department of Justice to, for her to get her finger out and sort of make mm. a decision one way or the other. And eventually I got a, a two-line letter saying, I don't think I need to be involved in this. Uh, oh, my goodness. Anyway, fortunately, St. Osef Parish Council accepted that and yeah. um and sold me a plot in in the cemetery and and that was that was that so that really is is the story little knowing when i started it i thought i was just going to be telling the story of the trial but it ended up uh, completely different and and it was more on you know 20th and 21st century uh, uh journeys of a skeleton so had it not been for you getting involved she could still not have been buried. She could have still That's, just been with in the, the possession of somebody else, which is really yes, frightening yes. to consider, you know, yeah. in a sense, <sighs> you put her to rest. There, well, that's right. I mean, there. don't forget, there are a lot of human remains. Not, I'm not talking about necessarily mm. uh, with trial victims, but it's a personal beef of mine. I, I'm not at all comfortable with the thousands and thousands of, of human skeletons that are in museums, legitimately in museums yeah. all over the country. Uh, uh, they will never be put on display. And so, you know, I, I do have a, a big problem with that. But anyway, we're in, in a small way, we've, we've been able to put one of them right. Oh, so that's what a what a process and what a journey. Mm. I find that mm. fascinating. And it must have been difficult for you as well, because you started out working on the witch finder side of things. So you've actually seen it from both sides. You know, you've you've delved so much into Matthew Hopkins and his background in the witch trials. So you really did kind of start out on one angle and ended up the other side of the fence. Um You've obviously raised, as a result, so much awareness in respect of the injustice carried out to the victims of the witch trials. Can you tell us about the work that you've been going on to do? Because not only did you put Ursula to rest, you've obviously been doing a lot ever <clears throat> since that. Yeah, uh, it really was as a result of both of the, the documentaries that, that uh, you know, it brings home to you that we often talk about the villains and, and the victims, mm. you know, the Elizabeth Clarks, the Margaret Moons, the Rose Hallibreds, you know, people will never have heard of them. And yet these are the people we should be talking about. Yeah. And when you talk to young people particularly and all they hear is the headline, oh, executed for witchcraft. But if you go back into the detail and you say, oh, yes, Joan Prentice, she was executed because she sent her ferret out to kill two grown men. Yeah. That then, then people start to think, oh, maybe this, you know, maybe this isn't so good after all. So I, I did want to raise awareness of the detail or, or, and tell more stories from the victim's perspective and also remember the victims mm. and so I have um, in recent years sort of be, again been lucky I you know fate has stepped in to help me uh, to, to have memorials placed in significant spots to to remember uh, because particularly in Essex which has the dubious reputation of having executed more alleged witches than any other county in England so uh, it started off, um, there is a small uh, sign on the side of the Thorn Inn in Mistley, Manning Tree, which we placed mm -hmm. as part of the Witchfinder film. It's not a particularly good one, but it was, it was just all we could do at the time. But then the, the, the good one, the, the one I'm pleased about, we have a, 
uh, granite memorial in Colster Castle Park, uh, yeah. directly opposite Colster Castle, which remembers all those who were imprisoned there while awaiting trial, not just those who were found guilty, because don't forget, once you're arrested and charged, you, you could be out of circulation for six months to a year. Even mm -hmm. if you were acquitted, you could be held after your acquittal until you'd paid for your accommodation charges. And you yeah. somehow also got to be assimilated back into society and your neighbours have accused you before. So we wanted to remember all those accused. So that's what the, the granite one in Castle Park does. And uh, just this month, um, on the 1st of December, uh, a couple of friends and I, two, two ladies from the Blackwater Moot, and, I, and it's their idea uh, that we had one, we unveiled uh, an oak tree and a memorial in Admirals Park, Chelmsford, mm -hmm. in memory of all those executed uh, for witchcraft, because that's where they were executed. That well near, near to there. This is the closest public place we could find near to the the place of execution in Chelmsford. So th that's that, that that's very satisfying from a personal point of view, but it also. It makes people stop, and 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 again, we try to put a bit, a little bit of detail on the memorials to make people think about the reality of it, you know, and, and, the, yeah. and mention people's names, names. I mean, you said earlier that you know words are important, absolutely, yeah. and na names are powerful as well. So you know, their names shouldn't be forgotten. So so that's that's what I'm sticking to things that I, I feel I can achieve in, in my lifetime. I, I'm not looking for to, to have huge statues built, which need lots of planning consents and things like that. But I think just enough to make people stop and, and think and, and talk. So I, 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 you probably gather, I am quite comfortable chatting. So I, I do give talks to organizations that want to learn more about specific uh, Essex witch trials and I have to say it is more the ladies of course that are interested not surprisingly when when mm. it was more more women 90 percent of the of the victims were women uh, so uh, and and with the in October around uh, Samhain time then that's when there it seems to be more interest in in having the talks I did uh, five in in about three weeks uh, in October, so which is great. But I find myself thinking, "Hang on, I've already said that." So, <laughs> <laughs> but, it's so commendable <laughs> that you are. A, it, I think it is so powerful that you are a man talking about this and bringing this awareness to it as well. And I've always been. I honestly, John, I've never talked about any of the witch trials or any of this yet in the three years I've run the podcast, purely because. I wanted to give it the utmost respect. And for me, I've always kind of said it was never ultimately about witches. It was about women. And I've never wanted to kind of, you know, make it something that was like a novelty sort of using the witch phrase because that troubles me as well. I've always wanted to do this kind of topic with the utmost respect. Mm -hmm. Even as a child, my I've got quite a... Like my family moved to Cornwall, you know, we had like from London to Cornwall, my, my granddad was the next like copper as well. And they yeah. they ended up living in the middle of Bodmin. And like, so I got exposed to um, the Boscastle Witchcraft Museum, all the old ways. But I remember growing up and my nan would always say to me, oh, you know, because I've got like certain freckles in funny like positions and things like that. And she would <laughs> always say, you would have got like, they, they would have called you a witch. And it's still there. Like, we still say things like that to this day, like to, to women. And that, that was me as a kid being told that, thinking, oh, you know, that was the first, in, the, the first knowledge I had about the witch trials. Probably would have been about six or seven, something like that, yeah. that came from quite, you know, a heathen sort of background anyway. But yeah. I find it so powerful what you're doing. I've seen the memorials you've done at Colchester. I also, for the first time, went to Miss Lee and Manning Tree recently, which was really powerful. So I've seen what you've done there too. But I think it's just so 
admirable and the fact that you are kind of these stories need to be told and that's a big part of the podcast as well that that's kind of one of the things that I relate to your story in not not anywhere near the work you've done but is keeping these things remembered and alive and and in the witch trial respect and this so that it doesn't happen again in some in some form if that makes sense which was a big part of the the panel discussion that we were at as well now there was one thing you said actually at the talk that really got me about about pardoning people and I don't know if you're happy mm. to kind of yeah <clears throat> you said on that yes uh yeah it, it 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 does surprise people sometimes when I when I say that I yes that I, I do all I can to make sure these things are remembered but I I don't support the idea of seeking a pardon for them yeah and that usually makes people blink a bit and say well where's this bloke coming from and again, this is part of the, the copper background there, because you just think about the word uh, a pardon. Um, it's got a proper legal definition. And it's called the royal prerogative of mercy, which is a bit of a mouthful. Oh. And it, what it is, it's a petition, but it's not your normal petition, which you just send in in the hope that someone's going to discuss something. It's a legal form of petition. And you're petitioning the monarch directly mm -hmm. for forgiveness. It is not a quashing of the conviction. You are asking the monarch to forgive somebody for what they've done. And I don't think that's appropriate at all, because my contention is that they haven't done anything. They yeah. There's nothing to forgive. So I think it's inappropriate. Now, <clears throat> There are some instances where a pardon, I think, is entirely right. Uh, I'm thinking in particular of Alan Turing, who mm -hmm. was shamefully treated. And, of oh, course, that's, yeah. it, that's, yeah. it, that's in recent history. And yeah. he was convicted of, of homosexuality at a time when it was a criminal offence. Uh, yeah. Now, he was given a posthumous pardon not that long ago. And I can understand that would give some comfort to his family, who I mm. believe were actively involved in it. Now, that's different. In yeah. this situation, you've got people going back four and a half hundred years, 500 years almost. And you can't often people say, oh, I'm descended from so and so. I'm descended. Well, you might be. But then with all that space in between, we're probably all descended from in, in yeah. some way or other. Yeah. So. I don't think it benefits anyone living at the moment, other than perhaps it might give them a little warm glow to think that they've brought it about. But that's not what a pardon should be. It should be to have some significance to the immediate family or that individual, if they're still alive themselves. Yeah. If um, and, and it takes a horrendous amount of money. You have to have barristers and, and you know, not not just your run of the mill sort of uh, barrister either. You, you're talking about many thousands of pounds to get this thing done. And it's a lengthy yeah. process. So, no, I don't support that. As I say, I, I, I support th doing things that are achievable in my lifetime, because the longer it yeah. goes on, the, and the, and the, 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 the more these things are forgotten. So keep you right. Absolutely right. Keep telling the stories uh, yeah. for, for those who, who are really keen to do this, then you could think about quashing a conviction, uh, which, again, is extremely hard to do after all this time. Yeah. Yeah. I, I completely agree with you in respect to the pardon. Absolutely. And there was one of there was one last thing on the tool that really got me thinking is that we also have to appreciate that a lot of us like to glam, like glorify the fact that, you know, I think I was a descendant of witches. But even myself has you know been thinking perhaps I was a descendant of one of the ones that accused somebody else of being a witch because we don't know our, you know, our ancestors situation at the time you know what their standing was in society if for some reason they I don't know may have been part of somebody that had been <laughs> so yeah we, we were so keen to take that stance now of I think you know that was my ancestors but let's be honest you definitely could have been on the other side too statistically that's far more likely yeah. for, every, for every person <laughs> accused 
for every person accused, there are at least six or seven accusers. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. so yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. If, if any of our listeners would like to explore more in relation to your work or perhaps you know, information or books that are out there in respect of Ursula Kemp or Matthew Hopkins, what, spit as I say it, <laughs> where might you direct them to? Or well, what might you recommend that they read that's kind of out there? Uh, well, what I'll do, I'll supply you with the, the link to the Ursula Kemp uh, documentary, which you can watch oh, on YouTube. Um, which finder at the moment is, is uh, not available. It was available on DVD. Uh, the run uh, is run out at the moment, but I'm hoping to get some more done in the new year. When that happens, then I'll I'll uh, send you a link if that's okay. Uh, okay. The the book, the best best by far book um, to deal with the the tragedy of the, the 17th century witch trials, which are the horrendous ones, which involve, and it gives you far more insight into the how the whole system worked as well as well as being very very insightful and descriptive is a book by dr malcolm gaskill Mm -hmm. and it's called witch finders a 17th century tragedy again i'll 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 send you the detail um uh, so that you can put it on but but really uh, that that is the the book we used as the background for making the film witch finder and malcolm very kindly uh, agreed we could use all the stuff in his book for it and he came down onto the set um when we were filming some of the scenes so uh, that that wow. that really is a, a very good book oh fantastic john it's been an absolute delight i've been enthralled listening to everything all your stories so i cannot tell you how great it's been to have you on i think it's been absolute gold thank you so much i've enjoyed it thank you